when you go to a certain page, if you go, to, if you go from Google, type in ShmooCon, go to the ShmooCon webpage, or go to Yahoo and type in ShmooCon and go to the ShmooCon webpage, both times you do that, you're, you're sending a vote for Google or a vote for Yahoo into the algorithm. Now, that vote is weighted differently based on, you know, how big the page is, so the weight for Google is probably more. So that makes the page more popular. But essentially, uh, you can map this out to see what are the most popular pages out there. Well, that's not something that you, just, you, know, that you can use for that. You can use that for organized crime, gangs, terror cells, other organizations. And what you're doing is you're mapping social relationships in terms of nodes and ties. You can also perhaps determine the social capital of individual actors. And you can find perhaps, if we take out this one person, can we collapse this network if there's no one to replace him? Pretty interesting stuff. So who are, the fr who are, who are someone's closest friends and associates? This may help in escape math. If we know that ha they have certain friends in a certain area, they may be going to those places. Where might that person go to? Could you eliminate a specific individual from a certain group to cause an organization to collapse? This is a social network of a project team. They had just missed a, a deadline. And uh, this is actually a, an email social network analysis. Each color was a, different, uh, was a different department that was working on this project. And what they, when, they, when they saw this, what they found was that none of the, project, none of the teams were working together. You know, and you can see by this map that the blue team is, all the teams are basically by themselves and not interacting with one another. And they actually used this to determine that they needed to work together more, and they actually, you know, went on to complete the project. So how do we apply this to math? Well, this is a social network analysis of, of some of the 9-11 terrorists. Most of the terror cells were suspected to be very autonomous, did not have leaders, um, and after this network analysis was done, you can find that certain people, like for example in the top left there, Mohammed Atta, were actually very central to the network. And they found that the 9-11 terror cells were actually very similar to, you know, your typical IBM project team, where, it, you know, so it, it's, it, was, it basically bucked the conventional wisdom on, on, um, on terror cells at the time. Yeah, I just want to say, these kinds of... Um those kinds of diagrams. We use these all the time in organized crime profiling uh, to determine the organizational chart. And there's actually some really good software out there right now that will sift through. If you put in someone's name and their known associates, it starts doing link analysis like this automatically. And you can build these things up and it actually discovers relationships you never knew existed. So for organized crime, uh, drug uh, groups, all that kind of stuff, gangs, this stuff is actually one of the things that detectives now swear by. I'm going to keep going fast. Talk uh, about crime mapping. This is a chloroplethus This was from France in 1829, and this was kind of like the first example of crime mapping. And this was mapping property crime by region in France, so you could kind of determine where was the most crime going on. This is an example of a, a map that was made uh, by a doctor in London in 1854 during a cholera plague. Um, the map um, demonstrated that almost all the deaths were surrounding one particular well in this neighborhood. And big surprise, when they turned off the well, all the deaths stopped. Um, but, you know, even at that time, there was no evidence that people were still skeptical that, that water was the carrying source for cholera. And this was kind of the first, this is considered one of the seminal events in the, in the entire field of epidemiology. So a good example now where, of where maps help someone to, you know, solve a problem. NYPD has been used in pin mapping since at least 1900. The University of Chicago mapped crime in Chicago neighborhoods in the 20s and 30s. And what you're trying to do is identify a relationship between crime and, and different neighborhoods and whether you cannot find where crime exists more often than, than somewhere else. Late 1960s, this process started to become automated, but it, however, did not really take off until the 90s. The first example of, of mapping crime was hotspot analysis, so finding concentrations of crime. And then we'll talk about profiling. If psychological profiling tells you who might have done it, geographical tel profiling tells you perhaps where it took place. And this just shows you that, that uh, automated crime mapping has increased you know, almost exponentially since the 19, early 1980s. This is a hotspot analysis of Newark, uh, New Jersey. 
it's pretty obvious where most of the crime's taking place. How is this useful, how is this useful to a police officer? Well, you can determine where you want to focus your efforts. This is hotspot analysis of, of Washington, D.C. in a two-year period, 1994 to 1995. Uh, all the dots indicate murder locations. You will notice that there is only one murder west of Rock Creek, and you are west of Rock Creek now, so you're in one of the safer portions of Washington, D.C. But that was 1990. True. <laughs> so geographic profiling can tell you where. This, I want to make this point. This is very important. This is suitable for serial crimes. So you're talking about three, four, five, perhaps more crimes where you can use this. Murder, rape, robbery, arson, other predatory crimes. This is not going to tell you the house that the guy lives in. This is going to help you sift the mountains of data to a manageable point. This also doesn't replace traditional investigative techniques. This supplements them. These are pro I'm sorry I'm going fast. We're running out of time. These are some of the programs that are out there that, that, that do this sort of thing. This is based upon journey to crime, how far people travel to commit crimes. Typically, criminals, typically, the criminals leave a buffer, a zone around their house, but stay relatively close to where they live and where they're familiar with. And then the principle of least effort. If, you're, if your gas tank's just about empty in your car, all the gas stations in town cost the same price. Where are you going to go? Whatever is closest or more convenient to. And, and typically, criminals do the same thing. This is a series of serial arson cases in British Columbia. These were the locations of the arsons. This was a, a Jeopardy surface which basically predicted where the guy might be located. This is applying it to the map. That's where the guy lived. And that was his parole office. <laughs> this, was, this was done by a man named Dr. Kim Rosmo who really, prof or really you know, pioneered the technique of ge geographic profiling. He also did an interesting analysis of perhaps where the killer of Jack the Ripper, where, where Jack the Ripper might have lived. And some of the most, some of the most uh, serious suspects do in fact live right in that, that dark orange area. So we, uh, back in uh, December and in January, uh, there was a series of uh, delivery truck robberies that were going on in Reading, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. So we've, we decided, let's, let's see if we can at least you know, on an amateur level, predict what's going on. These were the locations of, of the delivery truck robberies. We started an analyzing this about halfway through, about five or six crimes into the estimated 11 or 10 or 11 that actually took place. This is what's called a, uh, a convex hull. It's basically, if you put pins in a map, this would be putting a rubber band around all the pins. You know, typically, typically offenders live within that zone. That's the center. These are the areas that, that Without doing any other analysis, these are the areas that we first came up with that would be the probable offender areas. Um, the bottom one was what, was what Thorne said. I, I basically eliminated that area based on, and this is where knowledge of the area comes into play. Once I, once I told him that that's a commercial and government, there's very few people that actually live there, you know, we can eliminate that area. And the other area in the center there uh, again, a, a more upscale neighborhood, not likely to have a, someone involved there. So, you know, this was my focus right here. Not only, was, not only did it fit the profile of, of where the crimes are being committed, but it's, it's a very crime-ridden neighborhood. Those are where the two offenders live. So we got pretty close on one. The other one we were, were considerably far off on. However, we don't have all the data. We're going from newspaper reports. Were they both living in the same house? Um, did they work in a different location? We don't have information that the investigators had, but we came pretty close on one of them, you know, right on the border of where we suspected that they might live. I'm not going to go through these. These are just other examples of where you could possibly use, use math to help some crime, and now I'll turn it over to Frank for the last section. Okay. So I said back in the beginning we were going to come back to... Um, NYPD and why they're kind of leader in a lot of these things. Um, in our first submission on this paper, we had asked, you know, is the minority report something that's eventually going to come about? And in some ways, the future is now. We have what's known as the real-time crime center that NYPD came up with. Um, they, they actually put this thing together a few years ago. It's a center, the room is something about the size of this room, 
Uh, it's got huge projectors. It ties a bunch of databases together. It's got 26 member staff that are on 24 hours a day. They're available for hot crimes. 